Hi, this is Kevin Trainer. Welcome to my lecture on uh, Chapter 1 of a book that I call in my course uh, ID4E, Interaction Design 4th Edition. And um, the long name of this book uh, is Interaction Design Beyond Human Computer Interaction 4th Edition uh, by uh, Priest, Rogers, and Sharp. And um, here, today, we're talking about uh, Chapter 1. So, uh, we begin by uh, uh, talking, you know, we're trying to give you some idea about what interaction design is all about as a, as a discipline. And uh, since it's a multiple... Uh, a multidisciplinary discipline it's about quite a lot of things so we'll be talking about quite a lot of things during the chapter and uh, uh, I hope from the collection of those you'll get the uh, the look and feel of interaction design what it's uh, talked about so we begin by talking about um, uh, well really uh, observing that uh, some designs are good and some designs are bad um, at least for the context in which we're trying to use them so for instance uh, here we have a picture of an elevator panel and um, it's uh, kind of busy it's kind of kind of hard to tell um, the elevator controls and the labels on the bottom row all look the same, so they look pretty similar. So it's easy to push a label by mistake instead of a control button. Um, and this, uh, it turns out, we're going to talk about uh, a consideration called affordances. And uh, affordances are uh, uh, properties where some kind of a design element gives us a hint about its use. Uh, and so we don't really get effective hints about the use of things in the bottom row. But in the top row, we seem to. We've got uh, one, two, and three. They don't look like something you push. And we've got the buttons that are next to one, two, and three. They look like something you push. And the button that's next to three seems to be glowing yellow or something like that. And it wouldn't be hard to guess that that means that that's been pushed, right? So um, we'll be talking about this kind of stuff. So this is, uh, uh, we see improvement opportunities here on the bottom row, and maybe some improvement opportunities on the top row, but um, um, that's what we want to take away from it. Uh, here on this uh, slide, um, we're uh, showing you a vending machine and this, uh, this looks pretty busy too, even more busy than the elevator. And in particular, it's a little bit hard to know how to get started. But there are a list of instructions. So you do see that there's a step one, a step two, and a step three. Um, uh, but why is this uh, vending machine so bad as uh, designed for interaction? Well, um, First of all, um, wouldn't you really like to have an experience where you didn't have to read the directions in order to have it? Okay? I mean, vending machines aren't that complex. We've been using them. Uh, I've been using them for many, many years, and you probably a little bit less. But um, when a uh, vending machine has a... Um, an interaction it design that's uh, good, we probably can interact with it without respect, without having to consider what's the first step, what's the second step, what's the third. They're just kind of intuitive, okay? And I'll admit that some of that is built on prior experience, but uh, here um, uh, it looks like we need to push a button first to activate the reader, Normally, in a lot of uh, a lot of these things, you would insert a bill before you'd be making uh, a uh, uh, selection. 
So there's a, a pretty common experience of the way these things are designed. And this particular one goes against that. And they try to make up for it by printing instructions on the face of the machine. Um, but still, um, personally, I doubt that um, they got a better re result. They would have been better to uh, keep things more in line with the user's intuition based on prior vending experiences than to do what they did. And maybe this uh, one, two, three is just um, just uh, kind of a band-aid that they've put on a, a machine design uh, that has a very poor interaction design and was almost unusable without the instructions uh, printed on it. Now, good design. Um, one example that we, um, that the authors uh, talk about in chapter one is they uh, contrast the design of an answering uh, machine that would be used in a hotel room uh, with one that uh, it's a classic uh, good uh, design um, from uh, way back in 1995 and it was called the marble answering machine um, and it was uh, designed by uh, Bishop and um, the the idea here is, is that if we don't have a slide on on what the, the typical hotel uh, telephone functionality is for uh, getting your messages, but when you um, when you read the account of it in the textbook, there it's pretty hard to do without reading the instructions at the same time, and it was a pretty frustrating experience just to read the account of it. Um, on the other hand, this experience is well designed. Um, the messages are represented by marbles and you pick them up and you um, you manipulate them manually and depending upon where you put them it does one thing or the other with the message it uh, it uh, plays it it deletes it it uh, stores it and you only have to do one step actions to perform all the core tasks that have to be done and this is a really uh, a an example of good design although they do have I, I think uh, an, an important uh, discussion about the fact that perhaps whereas uh, this kind of design might be completely appropriate for a household that doesn't have any children um, it might not be as appropriate for a household with uh, children because marbles are a choking risk and they are sort of an attractive nuisance for children and they might not be appropriate in a in a hotel situation where people are inclined to take souvenirs so um there are a lot of good aspects of this that design but it, 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 it uh, given that we're talking about a hotel room, um, it's maybe not perfect. Um, another example that was given in the book is uh, the remote control for the TiVo. And um, my family were TiVo users for, well, probably more than five and less than 10 years. And uh, I've got to say that of all the remotes that I've had to use, I did best with the TiVo remote. Now we've we've left the TiVo, and we now use the uh, DVR that comes from uh, the AT&T cable folks, and I don't like that as much as the TiVo one. And it's probably true to the extent that I do like it is that it uh, it borrows a lot of, of the design principles uh, from the TiVo remote control. So what were the what were the salient uh, features of the TiVo remote control design? Well it was a pinup shape to fit in the hand which was nice. 
um, it has a it had a logical layout for the buttons, and they were color coded and distinctive, and they were easy to locate. So we have a link here to an article on the design of the TiVo remote, and I punched through and looked at it, and I'd recommend that you do too. Uh, it, it, it's really a nice example of the kind of uh, the kind of good uh, design results that we can get um, if we simply put the time and the resources into it. Um, but um, one of the most interesting things is that we move off of uh, feeling good about the, the TiVo remote to a more general problem uh, that's uh, uh, arisen in the TiVo, in the post-TiVo uh, days. What's the best way to interact with the smart uh, TV? And I personally have had a lot of different experiences with that, and I'm, I'm not uh, completely happy. Right? And, and I would guess that you're not completely happy either. Um, so what's the best way to, react, to interact with a smart TV? Is it some kind of a standard remote device? Um, do we do it like Apple did with some kind of slimline remote control? Um, do we use uh, something like Minim's new uh, keyboard that they uh, show us a little more about in the textbook. It's, it's, it's really hard to tell. I think we're still working our way through uh, the problem, and we haven't settled on uh, one approach that seems to be the best yet. We have a lot of approaches, and they have um, things to recommend them, but... Uh, the design uh, question about how to interact with the smart TV is uh, kind of unsettled right now. And that's okay. It will settle down over time. Um, so when we do go about designing, um, one of the questions we have to uh, take into account is what to design. So we need to take into account who the users are what activities are being carried out, where is the interaction to take place. And uh, for me, as a uh, new designer, I was, for a long time, I was very much, um, had this idea that uh, there, were good there were good designs and there were bad designs, and one just had to learn a good design. Uh, and then one could turn out uh, good designs, and that would be okay. But um, when we talk about here, we need to take into account who the users are, what activities are being carried out, what interaction is taking place. Uh, the goodness of designs is uh, very situational. So um, a particular design that might be good for one set of users or one set of activities or one in interaction um, in a particular place could be um, pretty bad and for another set of users and another set of activities taking place in another place. So um, we want to get you thinking like that from the get-go. We need to optimize the interaction that users have with our product. So we need to match the user's activities and their needs. So, how do we go about understanding the user's needs? Well, there are a lot of considerations here included in them. We need to take into account what people are good and bad at generally. And of course, when we're getting down to products for individuals, we also have to think about what they are good and bad at individually. Um, we need to consider what might help people in the way they currently do things. Uh, we need to think through what might provide quality user experiences. Um, it helps to uh, get the people themselves involved, um, either uh, generally by, uh, say, uh, research that would involve uh, focus groups and things like that, or individually by uh, going and asking the people who we're trying to design for 
uh, exactly what they individually would want. And we're going to be talking about in this course uh, tried and true, tried and tested, user-centered methods. So our approach is going to be user-centered. Okay, so what designs are going to be good for a particular set of users and, and because of that our methods are going to be user-centered. Back to the question of what is interaction design. Well, we've got some um, we've got some um, well-respected writers on the uh, on the subject. Uh, the first here is a quote from our authors, uh, Priest Sharp and Rogers. Designing interactive products to support the way people communicate and interact in their everyday and working lives. And um, Winograd, who's a well-respected uh, uh, human-computer interaction and interaction design uh, writer, says, uh, the design of spaces for human communication and interaction. So what are our goals? Well, our goals are to develop usable products. So usability means uh, a list of things that include uh, easy to learn, effective to use, and provide an enjoyable experience. And one of the things that I really liked about the interaction design um, way of thinking uh, is this idea that uh, uh, people like to have enjoyable experiences and we, um, we desire to give them to them. Um, now, how are we going to do that? Well, to a certain extent, we have to have a user-centered process. The only way to, you know, to know what's going to be... Uh, easy to learn, effective to use, and provide an enjoyable experience is to get involved with uh, people who do use or who would use um, the, the individual product or the kind of products that we're uh, designing. Uh, which kind of design? Um, there are a number of other terms uh, used to emphasize what is being uh, designed. So you'll hear people talk about user interface design, uh, software design, user-centered design, product design, web design, uh, experience uh, design, uh, user experience design. Interaction design, which is what we're studying, is meant to be an umbrella term that covers all of these aspects of, of uh, design. So uh, our approach is going to be multidisciplinary and integrative. Um, fundamental to all disciplines, fields, and approaches concerned with um, researching and designing computer-based systems for people. And when we talk about computer-based uh, systems for people, uh, this is pretty wide, okay? Uh, it, uh, 20 years ago, computer-based uh, systems for people were, for the most part, information products, okay? So they were uh, computers per se, um, now, uh, uh, we've gone to the part where uh, normal, everyday um, objects, things like, say, uh, telephones that weren't originally computing devices, have, have become computing devices. So, um, when most of us uh, think about the telephone experience that we like, we generally think about the smartphone. Uh, which has become a computing device. Okay, and then on top of that, um, sort of under the rubric of the Internet of Things, um, B 
because the computer processors have become so small and inexpensive, um, uh, computing has been added to control the interface on all kinds of objects in which it wasn't originally involved. So uh, small appliances, all kinds of things having to do with automobiles, um, just just uh, things all over our world that uh, once had mechanical interfaces now have uh, computer controlled interfaces so it's it's uh, uh, it's not just information uh, the products that are going to have um, uh, designs that are going to be covered by this um, interaction uh, design uh, practice area. This is a slide I love because it shows us just how many um, academic disciplines design practices, uh, information systems, or inter interdisciplinary fields contribute to interaction design. So when you look at the list here, these are all uh, people who uh, are legitimately concerned with uh, issues that are of interest to us as interaction designers. They all have their own particular point of view. Um, they all have, have uh, uh, something to add. And instead of us uh, saying, okay, um, one of these points of view is correct and everybody else is wrong-headed, uh, we're really going to do the opposite. We're going to say that uh, these people all have something to add to our field and it's going to be our job to come to understand what they have to add and to, and to find those things and to bring them in to inform our practice. So the academic disciplines include ergonomics, psychology, and cognitive science. In fact, I, I've got some ongoing slides on this. So um, let me go on to that. So uh, the academic uh, disciplines contributing to interaction design include psychology, social sciences, computing sciences, engineering, ergonomics, and informatics. The design practices contributing to interaction design include graphic design, product design, artist design, industrial design, um, and uh, some things from the film industry. Uh, interdisciplinary fields that do interaction design include HCI, which is human computer interaction, ubiquitous computing, human factors, cognitive engineering, cognitive ergonomics, computer supported cooperative work, which is uh, referred to by uh, the letters CSCW, and um, information systems more generally. So, um, we, uh, you know, we're not going to pick uh, one of these uh, disciplines or, uh, or uh, practices or uh, uh, multidisciplinary practices. We're not going to pick one and, and say, uh, these guys are right. Everybody else is wrong. Okay. What we're going to do is come to appreciate what everybody has to offer to us as interaction design practitioners. Um, now, this is going to lead to uh, teams of people working on interaction design projects that are going to be multidisciplinary teams. And um, it's something that uh, has occurred to me over the years as I read uh, various uh, books, and some of them have a point of view. Um, they'll say things like, uh, well, the kind of people you need on your team are these. <laughs> and, of course, everybody's kind of selling their kinds of people. 
Um, in contrast to that, we're saying that you could easily have a pretty uh, diverse team of people um, who can come together and contribute to a uh, uh, successful interaction design project. And I would even go farther. I would even go say, I can think of a couple of different combinations that would work. Like, I'm not even going to say that you need one of these and one of those and one of these. I can see, uh, I, I mean, I come to realize I'm going to be picking my team from real people. And they're going to come with a variety of experiences and uh, capabilities and sensibilities. And I could see several different uh, configurations that might work quite well for a particular project. And as the project manager for that project, well, it's up to me to get uh, some combination of members on the team who are going to uh, are going to be high performing. Um, so many <laughs> people from different uh, backgrounds can be involved. Um, they have different perspectives and way of ways of seeing and talking about things. Uh, the benefits of having this diverse group of people uh, is we're going to get more ideas, more designs uh, generated. Uh, the disadvantage is, is it might make it a little bit hard to communicate. You might have a little Tower of uh, Babel uh, problem here because not only will the ideas be different, but some of the terminology is going to be different. Um, and so... Um, managing this uh, process becomes uh, challenging from time to time. Uh, okay, I think that beginning from a multi multidisciplinary point of view helps. Uh, saying that we want to take uh, value from diversity uh, helps. Um, it driving our project towards an informed consensus, I think, helps as well. So, um, how does the interaction design business work? Well, there are some big time interaction design consulting firms that have been doing some great work and have been making a pile of money. And here we're just going to talk about four. Uh, there's the Nielsen Norman Group, and they say that they help companies enter the age of consumer, age of the consumer, designing human-centered products and services. They're very well known. Uh, Cooper. Um, at the end of this uh, chapter, there's there's uh, there's a reference to uh, the Cooper uh, textbook. Uh, which was the first one that I used in this area. It's called uh, About Face. It's up to the fourth edition. And it's authored by uh, the movers and the shakers from uh, Cooper. And Cooper is actually named after the founder, whose last name is Cooper. And they talk about from um, research and product to goal-related uh, design. So goal-related uh, design is a big issue for the Cooper folks. There's SWIM, provides a wide range of design services, in each case targeted to address the product development needs and hands. And there's um, a very popular and big outfit called IDEO that's done some cool stuff that I've seen and really really admired. They say they create products, services, and environments for companies pioneering, pioneering new ways to provide value to their customers. So some of these guys have some big-time clients, and these big-time clients have come forth with some very successful products. So I'm sure you can find some bad, some bad examples. Uh, but they each have uh, more than a handful of things to point to that they've done that are pretty darn interesting. Um, uh, so 
uh, learning about them and what they've done is uh, can be inspiring. It, it's inspiring to me. I hope it is for you too. Uh, what do professionals do in the interaction design business? Well, uh, interaction designers, I guess we're going to say that's what we're training to be. There are people involved in the design of all interactive aspects of a product. Usability engineers, people who focus on evaluating products using usability methods and principles. So, um, um, that, that has a big evaluation component. Web designers, people who develop and create the visual design of websites such as layouts. Information architects, people who come up with the ideas of how to plan and structure, structure interactive products. And user experience designers, people who do all of the above who, but who may also carry out field studies to inform the design of uh, products okay and and uh, we're saying that these is, you know this is all good stuff okay maybe these are slightly different focuses on the practice area that we're talking about but they're all uh, legitimate points of view and they're all things that you could uh, you could aspire to you know to be and do let's talk a bit about the user experience um, uh, it, it, what we're trying to get at is how a product behaves and how it's used by people in the real world. Um, the way people feel about it and their pleasure and satisfaction when using at it, looking at it, holding it, opening or closing it. Every product that's used by someone has a user experience. Okay, I think the people who talk more carefully about this would say every product that is used by someone leads to a user experience. Newspapers, ketchup bottles, reclining armchairs, cardigan sweaters. All aspect of the end user's interaction with the company, its services, and its products. Uh, now we're going to say that you cannot design a user experience. You can only design for a user experience because the experience is what the users have. Okay, you know, we can try to influence that. We really have to, we really have to admit that we're only influencing it. We're not designing it. We're not controlling it. These are things that happen um, to people. It's part of their human existence. So it's probably most appropriate, let's say, appropriate to say here to draw the distinction that we're designing for a user experience. We're not designing a user experience per se. Now, one of the examples that we talk about in the text, and one that I relate to a lot, uh, is uh, the Apple iPod. Uh, I've been an Apple iPod user for a long time, although I've got to say that I've, I've hung up my Apple iPod in terms of the, the iPod-like features that have been, uh, have been put into the iPhone. Now, in our family, uh, we have some uh, differences here because uh, I put my audiobooks that I listen to a lot and my music on my iPhone. It kind of uh, clutters up the memory, but I just about have enough. And my wife, um, she would rather have her audiobooks and her music on her Nano. I think they're also on her iPhone, but it, typically when she wants to listen to something, she just wants to use the little Nano. So um, they've got very similar functionality, but they've got a real different form factor. Uh, uh, my iPhone 6 Plus is about maybe 40 times the size of her Nano, um, and it may it may weigh uh, 40 times as much, um, but it pays your money and it takes your chances. Uh, but the iPod uh, what, it has been a phenomenon. Um, people liked the experience. So it was a quality user experience from the start. Uh, the product was simple, elegant. It was a distinct brand. 
it was uh, pleasurable to use. It became a must-have fashion item. It had catchy names. It was cool. It was all those things. Okay, and it, and it's uh, uh, pretty easy to see the iPod as a success in hindsight. As a guy who got um, interested in things like MP3 players before the iPod was uh, was even introduced as a product, I went through a ton of MP3 players before I got an iPod. It was probably um, it was maybe my sixth or my seventh. I and I had some that never worked at all, or I could never figure out how to work. Um, and yet, when I got to the iPod, I pretty well stopped until I got to the iPhone. Um, okay, so what's what's involved in this process of interaction and design? We say we're go we're going to be practicing it. That's what that's what we want you to aspire to. So, what are the parts? Well. The parts that we talk about here on this slide are the parts that are used to organize the remainder of this uh, textbook. Establishing the requirements for the product uh, in terms of I interaction, developing alternatives, alternative designs, prototyping those uh, designs, and evaluating them. Okay, so um, this is a uh, methodology. I would say that we're going to follow and it's the methodology around which our textbook is organized. What are some of the core characteristics of interaction design? Uh, users should be involved throughout the development of the project. Okay. Um, uh, Cooper, uh, I talked about Cooper uh, a little while ago. He's uh, He's uh, the uh, founder of the the interaction design firm called uh, Cooper, and a uh, pretty prolific uh, thinker and uh, writer on this. Um, one of his big issues is that people get worried about interaction design for their products way too late. Okay, so they get users involved way too late. They start thinking about designing the interaction way too late. And when they do that, he describes this as putting lipstick on a pig. Okay, so um, he would have you uh, worry about this from the get-go, and, and I would too. So that's our first point. Specific usability and experience goals need to be identified, clearly documented, and agreed to at the beginning of the project. Okay, so um, uh, unless we have a goal that we've uh, agreed to, or unless we have a set of goals that we've agreed to, well, we're not going to get there. And iteration is needed throughout the core activities. This is the idea that we're going to get there by successive approximation. Okay, we don't believe that just one shot at this process is going to get us an optimal result. Okay, we think that we, we're going to work at it for a while iter iteratively, and that iterative approach is going to get us uh, closer and closer to some kind of optimal solution. Why go to this length? Um, well, we want to help uh, uh, designers to understand how the design of um, interactive, excuse me, we want them to understand how to design interactive uh, products that fit with what people want, need, and may desire. Uh, we want them to appreciate that not one size it fits all. So um, uh, teenagers are going to want something completely different than, say, uh, grown-ups. Okay, so um, at a minimum, we're going to have to figure out what our audience is or what our audiences are before we do our interaction design. 
We want to identify any incorrect assumptions that may be lingering about uh, uh, with respect to particular user groups. One, um, one uh, classic one is this idea that uh, old people have low visual acuity, so they want devices that have big fonts. And um, you probably have seen the advertisement on TV for the phone that has uh, buttons um, that are gigantic, you know, and they show uh, uh, grandpa or grandma being very happy to uh, get that. Well, I, you know, I'm a grandpa type and I don't like that. And there are plenty of uh, people. I've, I've got my... Uh, 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 you know, my aunt and my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, these are all people well into their 80s. Um, and they they all have iPhones and they are all interacting with them and they're, they're fine with the fonts that are there. Okay, so uh, some of these assumptions that we make about groups of people are uh, uh, too general and not always in uh, our interests. And we want, the, uh, uh, we want, the designers to be aware of uh, people's uh, sensitivities, their sensibilities, and their capabilities. We also want to get you thinking about cultural differences, okay? Um, depending upon where we're going to be marketing our product, um, we might want to display the date in one format or the other. There's a format that's very popular in Europe. Um, there's a format that's very popular in the United States. Uh, which format should we choose? Should it be configurable? Um, one of the things that's, that, that's not really, um, hasn't been answered yet is, is that uh, certain products, like the iPod, for instance, seem to be universally accepted for, from people in all parts of the globe, whereas uh, things like websites um, are reacted to differently by people from different uh, cultures. And um, it could have to do with things like uh, websites are very reading oriented. I mean, they're very visual. Um, and so maybe people's reading experiences and history uh, have a greater effect on their preferences for the kinds of websites they'd like to interact with than they do with, say, uh, hands-on devices like the iPod. It's an interesting question, one which I think we'll know more about as the time goes by. We have to consider accessibility. So accessibility is the degree to which a product is usable and accessible by as many people as uh, possible. And a lot of times when we're talking about accessibility, we're talking about people with, and I'm not going to say different uh, disabilities. It's more appropriate these days to, these days to talk about differing abilities. Um, so people who don't have typical abilities, uh, they may have a mental or physical impairment, they may have some kind of a perceptual impairment, um, it could have an adverse effect on their everyday lives if they have to interact with uh, devices that are designed only with people with typical abilities or sensibilities in mind. And this is uh, uh, some of these uh, differing abilities are temporary, but more typically they're long-term, um, and they might be getting worse or uh, more different over time. Um, we need, uh, here's a slide where we talk about, uh, there's a good bit of the chapter where we show these different approaches to the online sales agent that IKEA is using or was using at the time that they wrote the the text. I don't have any first-hand experience of 
with the online sales agent at IKEA. But the idea here is that uh, the design might be different uh, for the U.S. and for the U.K., even though um, uh, we all uh, claim to speak English. Okay? Um, uh, so, uh, how could things be different? Well, uh, uh, but culturally, we, we could have some uh, different ideas about uh, uh, the way a sales agent uh, should look and sound and respond. Um, uh, people in the UK and the US do have a different vocabulary. Uh, they certainly have different pronunciations. Um, and, uh, and so uh, when we figure out what experience we're trying to provide, um, it's going to affect exactly how we would bring this, uh, online sales agent to life. One of the things that is interesting is, uh, when you talk about the UK and the US is that generally speaking, people in the U.S. have a favorable impression of a British accent. Uh, so that um, uh, if, in fact, we were to use the same online sales agent for both, we would probably do better to pick a, uh, a, a an online sales agent persona that had a British accent than one that had an American accent. Because uh, um, I think that, uh, generally speaking, uh, people with American accents are... Uh, are uh, are maybe thought uh, less of uh, or uh, not considered to be as authoritative to uh, uh, the British. And uh, that's probably true here in the U.S. as well. So, you know, we've got to start thinking about how people are going to respond. And again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to buy. And this is a point that's made, I, I think, several times in uh, Chapter 1 is that uh, we're not only trying to convey information in this uh, particular context, we're trying to get people to buy. Um, so, one of the things that we're interested in interaction design is usability. And so, uh, usability is not just one thing. Things are... You know, we can't measure usability on a single scale. Uh, but here are some typical considerations that we, we, um, we would like to use. Uh, it, it, we would like our product to be effective to use. We want it to be efficient to use. We want it to be safe to use, both in terms of personal safety and information preservation safety. Uh, we want it to have good utility. We want, want it to have a good uh, uh, fitness for the purpose. We want it to be easy to learn how to use. And we also want it to be easy to remember how to use. Um, here are some user experience goals that we're interested in. And when we're talking about these things, it's helpful to talk about some of the things that are desirable and some of the things that are undesirable. Um, there are some of us who think that we should always concentrate on the positive, um, but uh, keeping an eye out for the negative will help as well. So some things from the desirable list, uh, satisfying, helpful, fun, supporting creativity, emotionally fulfilling, and some things from the undesirable list, uh, boring, annoying, gimmicky, unpleasant, right? So we're trying to accentuate the positive and uh, we're trying to, uh, uh, trying to suppress the uh, negative. Um, Selecting terms to convey a person's feelings, emotions, etc. can help designers understand the multifaceted 
nature of the user experience. Um, how do usability goals differ from user experience goals? Well, let's think about that. Okay. Um, uh, they, they have an overlap in some senses, and they may be, so they may be reinforcing in some senses, and they, uh, they may be antithetical in some other senses. Are there trade-offs between the two kinds of goals? Can a product be both fun and safe? And I, I, I think it's a challenge to find a product that is both fun and safe. There are a lot of unsafe uh, fun products, and there are a lot of uh, uh, unfun uh, safe uh, products. But uh, of course, the challenge is to come up with fun, safe products. Um, how easy is it to measure usability versus user experience goals? Well, we're not measuring the exact same thing, but we're measuring similar things. I, I think, in my mind, we want to make sure that we measure uh, all those things of concern to us. And to the extent that they're overlapping or that they reinforce each other, well, we're going to see that in the data that we collect. One of the... One of the um, the terms that gets used a lot um, that I think uh, is important for us to try to um, give some body to is this concept of uh, design principles. So what are design principles? We say we want to follow uh, our design principles. Well, they're generalizable abstractions for thinking about different aspects of design. They're the do's and don'ts of interaction design. What to provide and what not to provide at the interface. They're derived from a mix of theory-based knowledge, experience, and a common sense. And for me, the most important thing about design principles is that we find things that are going to have a long life. Um, I, in terms of these uh, uh, computing-based uh, interactive uh, products, I've really been alive during their entire life. And so I've experienced uh, wave after wave of, uh, um, of approaches to uh, user interfaces for these kinds of products. And um, if you uh, think that what you're going to do is that you're going to come up with a list of what's good and what's bad, well, then I think you've missed the point. What's going to, uh, what's going to be available is going to constantly change. So these design principles are, um, are things that are going to guide us in continuing to, to uh, select the good over the bad and to separate the wheat from the chaff. Because as practitioners, um, we can't simply learn a list uh, today of things that are good, and those are going to be good forever. Um, uh, you know, what's good today is going to be so-so tomorrow, is going to be weak the day after that, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be something to be avoided uh, years after that. So the principles are, at least in theory, uh, principles that would guide us well over time. So, um, what are some of these? Well, visibility. That's a principle that we'd like you to be thinking about. Um, right here, we have a picture that's a control panel for an elevator. Well, how does it work? Do you push a button for the floor you want? Well, what if nothing happens? You push some other button? Still nothing. What do you need to do? Um, it's not visible as to what to do. So this has poor visibility. And a, a term that we're going to be using in a little bit is affordances. It really doesn't give um, good affordances. 
Um, um, we can see those buttons, uh, and we probably have some idea that we should push them. So those are probably good affordances. Um, but uh, what the consequences are going to be is not too clear. Okay, so um, uh, things are not visible in the situation we have there. Um, what if you need to insert a room card over? There's a slot over on the right. We need to insert a room card in order to get the buttons to the work. Well, how could you make this action more visible? Well, you could make the card reader more obvious, and I've certainly seen them do that. They'll put a card reader on the panel that's been kind of bolted on. Certainly not a pleasing visual design, but more visible. Um, provide an auditory message that says what to do. Well, what language should that be in? Provide a big label next to the card reader that flashes when someone enters. Make the relevant parts visible. Um, make what has to be done obvious. So this visibility is a challenge, and we've seen that in a couple of the, of the examples that we have seen so far. Um, uh, there's a good example that, that is in the book reproduced here on the slide of um, these uh, sinks that uh, measure our proximity uh, with various uh, technologies like uh, infrared light. Um, here's one in in the photo on the right where they have uh, they say they're automatic faucets and they kind of explain how to use them. Um, but it does say at the very uh, at the very bottom, black uh, clothing does not operate faucets. Um, so these invisible controls have a uh, uh, have. Uh, in some sense, they add a lot of value because they, uh, they're they not uh, mechanical things that are going to break, uh, okay? Um, you know, you go to washrooms that are old and uh, they've got handles on the faucets and they get rickety and they get leaky and they're uh, unsanitary in certain ways. And so, uh, you know, the ones you don't touch have uh, benefits. I mean, that's why we're doing them. They've got benefits even apart from cost. They've got uh, benefits to public health. And yet, um, it, 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 it's challenging how to make their, um, the way to interact with them visible. Uh, I think what's happened over time is uh, there's been a, a pattern that has emerged amongst the manufacturers that they work kind of similarly and, and so it becomes easier for us to learn what to expect from these kind of faucets but uh, uh, I still have some exciting times and I'm sure that you do too. Uh, feedback. This is another one of our uh, principles. Okay so visibility was the first, feedback is the second. So what is feedback? It's sending information back to the user about what has been done. It includes sound, highlighting, animation, and combinations of these. Uh, for example, when a screen button is clicked on, it provides uh, some sound or a red highlight, so you can tell that you actually clicked on it. Uh, another one of our principles is constraints. Restricting the possible actions that can be performed. Now, a good example of this, and one that's uh, shown, I think, well in the textbook, is uh, menus in which uh, all of the possibilities are listed, but the ones that can be, um, the ones that are currently active and not uh, disabled are uh, visually clear. You know, they're usually a black or white um, and easy to see, whereas the ones that are currently uh, disabled or constrained are in gray. 
Uh, it helps prevent the user from selecting incorrect options. Um, if physical objects can be designed to constrain things. For instance, there's only one way you can insert a key into a lock. So there's a lot of confusion that can be avoided um, by uh, designing uh, constraints. Now, um, so how about this example here? Is this a logical design? Is this a favorable, a favorable design or ambiguous? We've got, uh, we've got a couple of ports probably on the back of a PC. Uh, we've got, we don't have, uh, we do have some kind of a legend, but the legend symbols are in one spot and the ports are in another spot. It's, it, it can be challenging to know how they're correlated. Not only do you have to understand the symbols, but you have to understand how to map those to the, uh, physical, um, the physical uh, ports. So this is kind of challenging. It kind of reminds me of the controls on, on the front of our gas uh, a range in the kitchen. Um, there, uh, there uh, uh, typically I uh, get them wrong. So I look at the controls and they, you know, they have some kind of uh, they have some kind of a layout that is supposed to help you remember which uh, lights the back and which uh, lights the front. And I universally get them wrong. And I find out by uh, lighting the wrong burner. Uh, how to design them more logically. So we have a couple of ideas here uh, on the left side with A. We put them right next to it. Okay. Um, and we've got uh, proximity and then we've also got a little more information in the symbol and then b well we do color coding and then we uh again we have to find the legend um so these are two two alternatives i think are better than the ones that we showed on the slide before Consistency, you know, we've all heard about consistency in the user interface. Design interfaces to have similar operations and use similar elements for similar tasks. For example, always use the control plus the first initial of the command for an operation. Uh, control plus uh, C, control plus S, control plus O. Um, there's a good discussion of this in the book where for instance, uh, uh, control S, they give us uh, three or four different things that could begin with S. So um, some consistency is important, but it's certainly not foolproof. The main benefit of consistent user interfaces is they make them easier to learn and use. They lower the frustration of the user um, and they um, they increase the satisfaction. Uh, so when consistency breaks down, okay, we, we've got a, a good discussion here. Um, what happens if there's more than one command that starts with the same letter, save, spelling, select, style? Uh, you have to find other initials or combinations of keys, which is really where, for me, most of the uh, hotkey combinations begin to break down. I can only keep about three or four in my head for each application. They're better than nothing, but I, I just, uh, I don't have a wide range of being able to remember them. It increases the learning burden on the user, making them more prone to errors. Now, I, I'm going to, I'm just going to have an aside here, which, uh, uh, deviates from the material in the textbook and that is um, one of the things that we're going to learn or we're going to want to think about is is that certain modes of interacting are more appealing for different groups of users okay so um, uh, for instance uh, Cooper in in his book uh, about face has a really good discussion of the different needs of 
uh, beginners, intermediates, and experts. And uh, the Cooper people have done a lot of work or had done a lot of work in uh, consulting with people who were making uh, a desktop uh, products like uh, Photoshop and uh, Illustrator and things like that. And one of the things that was really important to them was to have a, a means of uh, using the product that was appealing to beginners, one that was appealing to intermediates, and one that was appealing to experts. And for instance, um, the menus that uh, Cooper believes are very appealing to beginners because you can use them to explore the capabilities of the product. You know, they tend to really lay out the possibilities and when you're still learning the capabilities, that's uh, quite good. Um, uh, a feature that, uh, according to Cooper, is very appealing to intermediates um, it are uh, features like uh, um, uh, uh, toolbar icons. Okay, so um, so you don't have to uh, click your way through the menu. You can remember where the toolbar icon is to do it, and just go up to the toolbar and click, and get it done with many fewer clicks. Okay, um, and of course, because you're an intermediate, you've got a pretty good idea of what the capabilities are. Uh, and you can put the things on your toolbar that you like. And uh, Cooper believes that hotkeys, for instance, are very appealing to experts. These are people who are going to be using the product all the time. Speed is very, very important to them. And they can, uh, they can make the investment in uh, learning the hotkey uh, uh, sequences. So uh, Cooper's point of view is that for, um, for uh, companies that are building uh, tools like, say, Photoshop, uh, that have millions of users, that it makes sense to have specific support in the product for all three groups. Now, for those of us who are building applications for uh, users in our own organization and our customers, sometimes we don't get the opportunity to to be able to cater to all three groups. So then we need to decide uh, who, who we want to cater to the most, um, who we're going to have the most of. And Cooper also has a really good discussion of uh, the fact that uh, users go through a life cycle um, in the people uh, begin as a novice or a beginner um, pretty soon they either uh, progress to being an intermediate or they quit the product this is in a situation where there are alternatives to the products like uh, Photoshop um, uh, so people don't stay uh, beginners for long. They either progress to being an intermediate or they leave. Um, and then uh, the other thing that he talks about is that uh, to be an expert in these uh, products, you really have to be using them a lot. And what happens to people is that they become experts, and then if they get away from the product for a while, they revert to being intermediates. So he talks about people being perpetual intermediates. So um, that's a whole discussion uh, for uh, another day. But uh, the idea that uh, certain features or certain uh, designs are kind of perfect in their own right, that they're going to be good or bad for everybody, is uh, naive. Okay, so we're going to be we're going to have to think about who who our customers are. Um, what their capabilities and sensibilities are, how they might change over time, and then how we want to spend the time and the money that we have to get uh, optimal results. Internal and external consistency. So internal consistency refers to designing operations to behave the same within an application. And, and I think we understand that pretty well. 
External consistency refers to designing operations interfaces to be the same across applications and devices. This is uh, typically done in a family of applications or some kind of a uh, suite. Or to a certain extent, um, what a lot of people like to do when they design the interface for their product is uh, to use uh, typical design idioms such that it's easy for people to learn. Okay, it'd be, it'd be very nice for your product to have a distinctive user interface, but if it's completely different from your competitors, um, uh, people may have a hard time uh, switching to your product. So uh, to a certain extent, you if there are um, interaction idioms that are tried and true, you would do well to uh, go with them. Uh, here's uh, something like uh, an external inconsistency. Um, do we want our number layout to look like a phone or do we want it to look like a calculator? I've had calculators that look like the phone. Oh, okay, well, uh, so what do we want it to look like? Uh, I talked about affordances before, and affordances, I think, are, are just a, a, a major uh, consideration. Uh, the meaning of affordances is, uh, to the extent that something gives a clue to how to use it, then it's uh, giving affordances. So it refers to an attribute of an object that allows people to know how to use it. A mouse button invites uh, pushing. A door handle affords pulling. Um, one of the interesting things that you'll see in some uh, designer um, uh, buildings, you go into, into office uh, buildings, is um, you'll see that the door handles that are on the inside and the outside of the door, it, typically the doors only push one way. Um, and designers, uh, visual designers, uh, architects and such, often would like to have the same kind of handle on the inside as they have on the outside. There's a certain kind of symmetrical elegance to that. Well, the problem is that there are certain kinds of handles that say push me and certain kinds of handles that say pull me. Um, you'll even see some handles where people will use a a handle that kind of says pull me but they'll you know they'll actually inscribe on that on that plate on one side it'll say push on the other side it'll play uh, I'll pay uh, say a uh, pull um, those are designers uh, trying to have their cake and eat it too I think that the ultimate design for door handles is on these say glass doors where you can see uh, both sides the, at the same time is a design that is a different on the different sides, gives affordances about which side you should push on and which side you should pull on, and at the same time has, is very uh, visually appealing. I mean, there are quite a few like that uh, too. So that's the kind of stuff we're talking about when we're talking about affordances. Um, this is a term that's been around since... 1988 when Norman used it to discuss the design of everybody uh, of everyday objects like my door handles uh, since then has been popularized into interaction design to discuss how to design interface objects okay uh, for example scroll bars to afford moving up and down icons to afford clicking on Uh, so what does uh, what does the principle of affordance have to offer interaction design? Um, uh, interfaces to a lot of our uh, interactive products are virtual, and they do not have affordances like physical objects. Well, that's not true of all of our objects. Certainly our telephone, you know, my iPhone has uh, some parts of it, 
are uh, physical buttons. So I'm looking at my iPhone here and I've got that kind of home button that's down at the bottom. That's a physical button and you can click it. It has good affordances. As I understand the new one on the iPhone 7 uh, is is not a physically clickable button. It's uh, it's like the buttons on the screen. They don't actually click. Okay, so we have some things that have really physical affordances and some things that don't. But we do um, we do try to introduce a behavior in the reactions in the user interface so that the the combination of um, interaction with the parts and then the animation behavior that we get does give affordances. Um, so Norman uh, believes that um, the kind of affordances that we're talking about in most of our interfaces is are better uh, conceptualized as perceived affordances uh, rather than real affordances like the door handles. But I think that's an interesting distinction. But uh, our uh, our uh, digitally I implemented uh, devices uh, can have affordances, and it's pretty um, it's pretty important to to be thinking about them. Uh, so, um, what about virtual affordances? Um, so we uh, have some we have some objects here. Uh, one looks like an elevator button. Uh, the black one with the blue on the inside just looks like a bad graphic. Uh, we've got a yellow thing with an outline. That might be a button. You might be able to click on it. You might be able to draw in it. I can't tell. Um, the stuff on the right side to me looks like the scroll bar that we've gotten used to on windowing systems. Uh, but interestingly, we, we have uh, a graphic set or next to it talks about the up arrow, the, uh, the down arrow, and the elevator button, which I must admit uh, I'm a little bit lost on. Those are not the typical meanings that we would ascribe to that kind of um, a graphical user I interface idiom. Some key points. Interaction design is concerned with designing interactive products to support the way people communicate and interact in their everyday and working lives. It's concerned with how to create quality user experiences. And I can't emphasize enough how uh, even though we're talking about digital products, uh, okay, we're not talking about uh, uh, mechanical products, okay? Even though we're talking about that, the pervasiveness of digital products in our life is unbelievable. And so uh, it's probably true that even some of the devices that we believe are mechanical, uh, because they give us a lot of those uh, physical affordances, um, are really digital. Okay, so this is big, this is pervasive. It requires uh, taking into account a number of interdependent factors, including context of use, type of activities, cultural differences, and user groups. It's a multidisciplinary multi it is multidisciplinary, involving many inputs from wide-reaching disciplines and fields. And I can't emphasize enough that that the the viewpoint of interaction design is it's very inclusive. So we're not going to pick one of the disciplines or fields and, and say, well, these guys are right and the other guys are wrong. We're going to try to bring as many viewpoints to our practice as we can, and to the extent that we need to, uh, to the extent that we need to uh, resolve differences in their language and their point of view, we're going to work at doing that because we think that builds some value for us and for our uh, clients. So that's the end of. Uh, 
end of the slides for uh, chapter one. I think this is, uh, I think it's a pretty cool chapter we're going to be doing uh, in future chapters. We're going to be getting closer and, and closer to the, you know, the skills that we want to build for the practice we would like you to be capable to perform. Uh, here we, we're really doing a lot of orientation. Uh, what is interaction design? How, how does it relate to a lot of other uh, disciplines? And uh, uh, we covered the high points. And uh, I'm hoping that gives you the orientation you're going to need. So having said that, I'm going to say bye until next time. Bye-bye.